show with your host Victoria Ho and guest hosts Gavin Huang and Clarissa Wei. Our special guest for today, the man that has eaten at over 7,000 restaurants, David R. Chan, and so much more. You are watching The Gold Thread Show. Hey everybody, welcome to the brand new Gold Thread Show. We're coming to you live from our studio in Hong Kong, and we're starting this regular show to mark turning a year old. We've got a big show for you today. We're going to talk about what's happening on Chinese social media, and we're bringing on a guest that you asked for, David Chan. David is the guy that's eaten at over 7,000 Chinese restaurants in the US, and many of you thought his obsession was fascinating, and some thought it was inspiring too. And because we're live, drop questions and comments throughout the show to chat with us. Finally, for those of you who knew we were celebrating turning one, you guys are also here to see if you've won some of our new swag, like our caps and tote bags and playing cards. We'll show those off and we'll announce the winners at the end of the show, so stay with us. In the lead up to our anniversary, we put together some of our favorite moments over the past year. Let's roll two of our clips and we'll have some of our producers on to tell you about them. When you're young, you kind of think Americanized culture is cooler than your own culture like it's a very normal thing to think about when you're a kid as a child i hated chinese food as a matter of fact for years the only chinese food i would eat was soy sauce and rice in the u.s what we understand to be chinese food is actually quite um, singular i think there's so much color and there's so much dynamism in chinese food that it's kind of our job to keep adding to it I felt like in the West, people knew Sichuan food as just the stereotypical extremes, like the diabolic heat or the face-numbing spice. But I think as an outsider coming into Sichuan, it's easy to miss the subtleties that are underneath. 
my motivation to change the world and create impact in some way is much higher than being a chef who wins awards and accolades. I want to share who I am a little bit more through the food I understand and the food I grew up eating. I'm always trying to think about that one moment in time where I had my favorite bowl ever and I'm trying to recreate what that flavor is. It's funny because my dad like never thought that I would be a chef. I think it's really awesome that I can make him proud by doing something that he loves so much too. Hi, my name is Mei Chow. Hi, I'm David R. Chan. My name is Lucasin. I'm Dory Fung. My name is Jenny Gao. My name is Peggy. My name is Jimmy Wang. My name is Richard Ho. This is Nick. Nick is our producer that's been with us from the start of this journey. He edited the two clips that you just saw. Nick, we have to talk about that first clip. Yeah. It um, was really emo. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, the clip uh, was about chefs, and I think uh, food is such a big thing for Gold Thread. And um, I've interviewed some of the chefs. I work with, uh, I edited a lot of the food videos, and I, I found that there's always something in common between them. It's the fact that they, they don't just cook for food, they always cook for some higher ideology, right? So when I edit that video, I was trying to find something in common. And then I heard that uh, really good soundbite from Mei Chao, the first chef. She said that uh, it's, very, it's very common for, for young people to think that, for people uh, to think that um, Americanized culture is uh, cooler than our own Mei culture. Chao, Mei Chao is a chef with, um, what, Happy Paradise? Yes, yes, and Little and Bao. And Little Bao, yeah. right, in Hong Kong. Yeah. And I think that that soundbite is very go thread. So I started with that soundbite, and then um, I tried to like put together a story. And then our editor Gavin helped uh, script in it, and eventually we, we have this wonderful piece. Uh, I really like that piece. Um, yeah, like you said, it's very emotional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of comments on that one. Mm -hmm. But you know, the second I, I was just imagining you cutting the second one. Yeah. And thinking about, I mean, Nick, uh, we just turned one, right? Like I said, and Nick has been with us for pretty much the start of the journey. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about some of your memories. You must have had so many when you were going back through all those clips. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like, what we're doing right now, it's been a year, and then we're celebrating our birthday. Um, a year ago, I, I still remember um, our first trip was to Chengdu. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went there for 10 days. Like, the four of us went there for 10 days. None of us know what to do, what we're <laughs> doing, and uh, what we're trying to do. So I was basically just like pointing our camera into people's face, hoping for the best. And then we, we end up with a bunch of random footage, which eventually is a good thing because uh, we're still using those footage until today. So uh, it, it's the whole thing, it's a big learning process for us. We've and been collecting uh, B-roll for a year. Yeah. Actually, what I remember from your um, Chengdu trip mm -hmm. was you basically saying that you didn't realize how spicy spicy food could oh be? Oh my god, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did train up though. Thanks you for trained that up? Yeah, I trained up. Thanks to that <laughs> trip, um, I, I came from eating like the lowest level of spiciness, uh, mi xian. Right, because Hong Kong food is not very spicy. Yeah. Right, and you grew up in Canada, so also yeah. not spicy. Yeah, after I came back, I, I love spicy food. <laughs> <laughs> tell, me so, uh, tell me about some of the other um, moments that you remember in the last year. I mean, you've gone from all the times you've had to go hiking with Clarissa. Mm -hmm. I always feel like 
You started to love hiking, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I've always been a city boy, and uh, it's good that now I have an excuse to hike more. Mm -hmm. And like just seeing how how Clarissa reacts to nature is is super fun <laughs> to shoot because <laughs> we all know that Cl Clarissa is like so down to earth. Uh, the last time we had a, a live cast, mm. you talked about that crazy story about mushrooms. Yes, but I still think a lot of people haven't heard that story yet. Mm. Uh, that was during one of. That was another yeah. Clarissa trip. Yeah. Tell us about your trip. Oh man, like I, I we went to Yunnan to shoot this stories about Mushroom Town. Mm -hmm. So basically, this town everybody re depends on like um, foraging mushroom. Mm -hmm. And then we met up with this um, um, this, this guy. Right? Yeah, right. that was supposed to bring us uh, to to forge mushroom. But the the night before, we went out for to drink, and it, I feel like oh, it's really nice hospitality. So I went out with him. We drank till like 2 a.m. <laughs> and then I, uh, he <laughs> insists on driving me home. And I thought, okay, he doesn't look that drunk. So I thought, and then the drive was like five minutes away. So I hopped in a car with him. And then we end up crashing a car 30 like seconds. In immediately. Immediately. <laughs> and then he started getting so emotional. He, he started like apologizing and thanking me for being his bro. I mean, the whole thing, we, we end up didn't go in forging with him but <laughs> we, we forged with our taxi driver the, the story turned out great yeah, yeah. well i mean no, if i can't complain if we can say that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thank you so much nick yeah guys i want to roll another clip to show you uh this was another one of our anniversary clips and this one's pretty trippy we'll bring on the producer that talked about the producer that made that one right after this中国的文人喜欢向往在山林当中建几个小筑就做这个几个房子然后和童子们一起在山林当中就是吃饭然后跟大自然进行亲密的接触中国人呢都讲究道法自然现在呢我们讲和谐和平和美和顺If you learn to turn your imagination to something three-dimensional, we use the knife as a way not to end life, but actually to regenerate life. Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry, we're just laughing because the folks uh, in the control room were telling us to pat <laughs> down Joel's hair. Please let me introduce Joel to you. Joel is our very, very talented video editor who made that ridiculously <laughs> trippy video you just saw. Um, but before that, I also wanted to say hi to everybody on Facebook and YouTube. Some of you are saying that you know, the videos are making you very hungry. Uh, some of you guys were asking about Easter eggs. I noticed um, that was one. I don't know if a lot of you guys caught it, but there was a Doctor Who reference at the end of the merch video with our tote bags. Uh, go check that out. But don't go away from this video, so check that out later. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, mm. this is Joel. Hi. Joel Hi. is from Hi. Australia, and he joined us, what, six months ago? Uh, no, I reckon it's getting on maybe nine. Oh my nine gosh. August, it's coming up to a year. Tell it's us about that trippy good. video first. Um, what was that? Yeah, uh, I don't know. That was we amazing. were kind of, what, given the directive to make some sort of mashup for the anniversary. Um, I mean, I think it was going back to some of the things Nick said about mushrooms <laughs> and um, <laughs> Clarissa's always off gallivanting around um, the countryside, whether it be, you know, in T China. You know, um, although Joel does a lot of our edits, uh, occasionally we let him out. Occasionally. Occasionally. They let me away from the desk. And then 
you go running around. Um, tell us about some of the stories that you shot recently. Um, we've been... Uh, recently, I was just in China with a fr um, one of the producers, Venus, um, mm -hmm. shooting a dragon boat story. That was crazy. Uh, that just came out last week. Uh, that was fun. A group of quite amazing women. Uh, you know, um, one of the things that you guys don't get to see is how well Joel gets along with all the aunties <laughs> in the office here. How was that? How was no, the it was good. Everyone the interaction was super with all the dragon boat aunties. And uh, really, yeah, talented, amazing, amazingly fit people. Uh, <laughs> they train six days a week and... Uh, yeah, it's it was uh, it was quite an experience. Even just being on the boat trying to shoot footage, it's you actually go you're going quite fast. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, they were they were amazing. Other stories, I think I've been out once with Clarissa. I know she drags Nick around a lot, but I think <laughs> I got to go <laughs> on one foraging shoot in Hong Kong. Um, so maybe there was some inspiration there. She, we're out um, eating lots of naturally growing weeds and plants in Hong Kong. Um, and that was quite amazing, some of the things you could find and just eat along the paths in the trails and that sort of thing. Um, and I think there's another video in there, this Dragonwell Manor, it was a farm to table, um, one of the most exclusive ones in China. I think Hanley shot a trailer even, uh, edited a trailer and uh, he used some pretty trippy effects in there. So that mm -hmm. might have kind of also came into the mix a little I bit. thought, yeah, I thought everything blended <coughs> together quite well. I mean, like a big fever dream, basically our entire time here. <laughs> with yeah, Gold Clarissa Clare. in one point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, well, thank you so much thank you. for being with us. Thanks, Vic. Just wanted to get you guys to see this <laughs> genius right here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, since you guys are here, you're getting a chance to see Friday's video story ahead of time before we get to our next segment, talking about what's hot in China. This is why we flew all the way to Chongqing hot pot, spiced with a generous heaping of peppercorns and chili peppers. For newcomers, it can and will wreak havoc on the digestive system. The people in Chongqing are absolutely addicted to it. Chongqing Hot pot restaurants are so plentiful in Chongqing that there are markets dedicated to supplying them with their key ingredients, like seafood and tripe. They open when restaurants close and close when the restaurants open. Usually, 现在用这个格子就是因为大家觉得很方便可以把那个菜放在不同的格子里面烫比如说中间这个主要是烫毛肚这些因为它温度是最高的中间这个温度地点的就是这个毛肚和鹅肠还有老肉片这三样我觉得
was it Facebook? Somebody on Facebook asked us, how do I get a job like Clarissa's? The answer is, well, the answer is we were incredibly lucky to meet Clarissa in the first place. She's been, you know, she was freelancing for many years, um, getting all her resources and contacts and everything. And also she really likes hiking and she's super rugged. So we just throw her all these wild stories to do. So please get in touch with us regardless. Anyway, I wanted to talk about what's hot in China. And for that, I have Gavin, yeah. our editor. Gavin often talks to me actually on a daily basis about stuff that's popping on Chinese social media and the Chinese internet. Uh, but what's the most important thing is I think for those of you who know, we're sitting here in Hong Kong and in Hong Kong, there's a big protest going on right now. Uh, the protest is regarding an extradition law. Um, a that proposed extradition uh, law. Proposed extradition yes. law. Uh, but we wanted to talk about one of the things that stood out to Gavin mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. And that is? Uh, so, of course, uh, there was a big protest. And on Sunday, it was organizers say there were over a million people at that protest. And as with any giant march and rally, there are a lot of creative signs, mm -hmm. a lot of creative protest signs. And one thing that caught my eye was the use of Pikachu. Pikachu, like <laughs> the Pokemon. In protest signs, <laughs> yes, the Pokemon. And there's a long story to Pikachu being used as a symbol in this protest. Mm -hmm. One is that one of the government officials that's supporting the extradition law is uh, his name in Chinese, or at least in Cantonese, sounds a bit like the Cantonese pronunciation of Pikachu. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> I guess. So that's <laughs> why they're that. using <laughs> Pikachu to reference this government official who's supporting this very unpopular proposal. And uh, there's actually a long history with Pikachu in Hong Kong and actually the way it's pronounced in Chinese. Interesting. Uh, a few years ago, Nintendo decided to change the Chinese name of Pikachu. I know it sounds a little weird to be able to say that you can change the name of something in Chinese. Well, I guess it's a it's a translation, right? Mm -hmm. In the first place. Yeah. Okay. Well, tell me what. So Hong Kong was the main target market mm -hmm. for right for a Pokemon, long time. For a long time. Right. Nintendo right. Uh, was targeting the Hong Kong market. Sure. And so, and of course, in Hong Kong, people speak Cantonese. Right. And so, what is the Pikachu, Pikachu in Cantonese? In Cantonese is uh, Beigatu. You. Okay. But then uh, a recently, actually three years ago, they decided to change it to the Mandarin pronunciation, which is Pikachu. Sure. And that's so? And I mean, those are different words. In Cantonese, that sounds like Beigayong, <laughs> which doesn't sound like Pikachu at all. See, at that it sounds like, a, it sounds like an ointment. Yeah. Beigayong. Yeah. <laughs> right. So a lot of Hong Kongers got mad and in fact, some even protested outside the Japanese consulate. We've got a photo from Quartz uh, showing some people actually standing outside the Japanese consulate with Pikachu dolls saying that they, they were protesting the name change. Because, because Pikachu is symbolic of this, well, I mean, I guess Cantonese is very much, can it's, I mean, people, it's people do like draw that. It's part of Hong Kong culture. I think the language is part of its right? local identity. And then Pikachu is a common childhood reference for anyone. Uh, and so I think it just shows how important even all these like sort of cultural touch points can be in identifying politics and identifying one sort of local identity and how one chooses to identify oneself with in a group. Mm -hmm. um, that's something even as innocuous as Pikachu can get political. That's true. Yeah. Well, that, that also, um, you know, that also reminds me of, uh, something else that happened that was big this week. I mean, mm -hmm. just talking about like sort of big, <laughs> <laughs> big mobs and you know, big, <laughs> big crowds of people. Well, big, yeah, not yeah. a mob, but like, mm -hmm. yeah, big activations. Yeah. Um, over in mainland China. Right. Over in mainland China, mm -hmm. um, a huge crowd of people c gathered outside Uniqlo. Yeah. Actually in Hong Kong too, there was like a huge line outside Uniqlo for this new collaboration uh, between Cause, the American artist, and Uniqlo. I think I think folks need to see the video. Oh yeah. To to get China to video. get to get a picture <laughs> of this. <laughs> of like how crazy this. Yeah, you need to see this.
Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so that was the South China Morning Post right. video of this mayhem. What? I mean, what, what? can you explain why people are even crazy about this? I mean, neither Uniqlo nor Cause, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. They're both big in China. They're I mean, the thing is, is like every time Uniqlo does a collaboration, it's a huge thing. It's mm -hmm. uh, people line up for it the way they would line up for a Supreme collab or uh, new Nike shoes. Um, and the thing with this collection was that it was Cause, Cause said this would be his last collaboration with Uniqlo, and ah. so people were going crazy for it. I think in China there were some people joking on social media that this was just that some people didn't even know what they were buying. <laughs> like it's just like it, it's it's just this sort of desire to compete and win and get something before anyone else can. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah. I think that's okay. I mean, I get that. I think that's relatively mm. universal. I mean, that's the whole reason why Supreme gets to sell what bricks, right, <laughs> in the first place. <laughs> right? Oh, you call and it and bricks. like, right, they sell bricks and they sell like what? Like yeah. fireman hatchets mm -hmm. or something? Yeah. I feel like I'm imagining this, mm -hmm. but maybe I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I mean, that's the thing, right? Mm -hmm. The. Yeah. The, the whole, I mean, what people are grabbing stuff off, mannequins, mm -hmm. and... But didn't you tell me that story uh, about yeah. the guy who said that he didn't want to wear... There was someone on social media who said that they were... Some, a friend had given them a cause shirt, and he was so scared of wearing it outside because he <laughs> thought everyone would think that he, like, basically looted it from the store. But isn't that the whole, isn't that the whole point? Like, you go crazy for this stuff just so that you can be the only person wearing it. Yeah, but I think with, like, the video clips coming out, people <laughs> just sort of think, like, oh, They're were like you part of that crowd oh, that was so just ugly. sort of ducking under doors to, like, grab shirts as quickly you know, as possible? It's actually too bad that you can't get, like, I don't know, you can't get, like, a... Like food delivery, right? Mm -hmm. This other story that I want to talk to you about is pretty similar, More at hype. least in, in terms yeah. of the, the psyche. Mm -hmm. So we want to roll a clip where we show you uh, white rabbit milk tea. This was a <laughs> pop-up that happened in uh, China. Yeah. <laughs> What people need to know is that that was a three-hour line <laughs> to get to that. For but like milk tea that milk tea, apparently okay. is supposed to be like made with white rabbit, but okay. people were saying L it doesn't even taste like white rabbit. Let's rewind Sorry, this story yes. first. First of all, you guys need to know what white rabbit <laughs> candy is. Um, <laughs> white rabbit candy is that iconic mm -hmm. sweet, that iconic mm -hmm. candy from China. Um, it's got the rice paper wrapping mm -hmm. on it. Well, the white rabbit company said that they were coming out with a milk tea. Yeah, because so they were celebrating their 60th anniversary this year. I see. And they decided to open up pop-up stores in Shanghai. They're still running, by the way. If you're in Shanghai, you can go wait for three hours if you want. Or, as I was saying, <laughs> or you can get a delivery guy to go, like, line up for you. Yeah, if you have, like, um, $70 to spare. Right, <laughs> 70 USD. So... One of the, so there was a black market that like popped up immediately. Mm -hmm. Am I, are you even surprised? Well, how much is a cup first? It's, okay, so if you wait online, it's gonna be three US dollars okay. for like a cup of milk tea that supposedly tastes like white rabbit. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you, okay, Gavin's very doubtful that it tastes like white rabbit. Not the only one. <laughs> it's vanilla. It's right. it's not hard to imagine that it yeah. could taste like white rabbit. But then, if you're too lazy to wait sure, online, sure. But if you're too lazy to wait online, you can pay seventy US dollars to buy it after someone else has already bought it. Right. Or you can ask someone to wait online for you. That's a that's a that's a hundred that's a ten time markup. It's amazing. It's more than ten times. <laughs> that's true. Sorry, it's a twenty times. Seventy markup. divided by three. Go. <laughs> um, two and twenty something. <laughs> anyway, yeah. yeah. So people were paying a lot for this. Um, I imagine that the taste might be kind of. Well, the thing is, White Rabbit. So I. So it's just vanilla. It's not <laughs> just vanilla. So like, we're not in agreement <laughs> about this. But White Rabbit is not just vanilla. It tastes like something else. It's plastic. It's not plastic. It's like the rice paper and the. Come on. Yeah. Well, anyway, regardless, <laughs> if you can't stand it, imagine drinking a whole cup of it. Yeah. No. 
Anyway. Anyways. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you. Coming up next, Clarissa, Clarissa Wei will be talking with our special guest, David Chan. But before that, here are a few clips from our previous story with David. Hi, I'm David R. Chan, and as of today, uh, February 12, 2019, I've eaten at uh, 7,440 plus Chinese restaurants. But what happened is about 30 years ago, and I probably think of maybe 500 Chinese restaurants at that time, and I decided, well, maybe I should start keeping track of where I've been to prevent inadvertently going to the same restaurant twice. David is a retired tax lawyer and third-generation Chinese-American from Los Angeles. I met him seven years ago on an online food forum called Chow Hound and asked him to meet me for lunch when I noticed he knew an enormous amount about Chinese restaurants in America. He told me he had this massive list of restaurants accumulated over the years. On an Excel spreadsheet where I list the number of the restaurants chronology order, the name of the restaurant, and address of the restaurant and that he had a collection of menus to go with them. When I started eating at Chinese restaurants, I thought I should have something from that restaurant. For me, it really the preferred item is a business card. But some restaurants don't have business cards, they have menus, so basically these are menus from places I went to that didn't have a business card. And so I ended up writing an article on him and drew attention to his list. But David's spreadsheet is much more than just a list of Chinese restaurants across the United States. It also sheds light on the evolution of the Chinese food scene in Los Angeles. First time you were here in 92? Yes, it was a really big deal when Ocean Star opened up. Has the crowd changed or the food or the atmosphere? Well, when it opened in 1992, I was like the greatest thing since sliced bread. Everybody had their banquet here. It was just something really phenomenal. The list is also a collection of David's memories and his road trips across America. Are any particular numbers specialty? Well, usually I try to make a hundred uh, a restaurant that it's unlikely for me to return to. <laughs> so 100 yeah. is Cincinnati, Ohio. We're going in Cincinnati, Ohio for like two hours. Yes, <laughs> it's a special number. Let's see, 1,000. Which is actually, Do you remember? Yeah, it's, uh, it's this uh, fast food place in Niagara Falls. It turns out this is my life history. And for example, once I went, yeah, how many times have I been to San Francisco? I go back and count and say, oh, I've been there 93 times. So I used to use the yellow pages just to see what I kind of feel on what I hadn't been to yet. But at some point in time, I got current, which means I'd eaten at every Chinese restaurant that was currently opening. They open. So what I would do is drive the streets. So if, so somebody just said on Facebook that if I ate at a Chinese restaurant every single day, it would take me more than 20 years to get as many as David did. Thank you, May. Let me introduce Clarissa first. This is Clarissa who did the story Hi. that you just watched. Hello. Yeah, so we managed to get um, a follow-up Skype interview with David on top of the interview we already did. Um, with some questions that you guys wanted to ask, and that question we actually addressed yesterday when we recorded this conversation. Perfect. Yeah, let's roll so that video. Let's roll it. Thank you so much, David, for joining us today all the way from Los Angeles. Um, our video of you did really, really well. So I'm just going to ask you some follow-up questions and mostly questions that I got from the comment thread. Um, on the video. Um, first of all, sure. just out of curiosity, did you get any responses or um, feedback after our video was published? We got a very good, uh, very good reception. And how did your family members react? I remember you sent me a message saying that your wife loved it. That's a huge compliment. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. I, I think everybody in the family so was quite impressed. <laughs> Um, and then a, a big reoccurring question that we got on all of our platforms, I would say, is how do you stay so skinny after eating at more than 7,000 Chinese restaurants um, since mm -hmm. the 50s? What is your secret to such a slim figure? Well, it's actually entwined with my personal philosophy on, on, on weight control because like 35 years ago, you know, I, saw a picture of me, I thought to myself, I'm 
kind of chubby. So what I decided is that I would weigh myself every day uh, and without changing my lifestyle that much, I would just control how much I ate. Um, and one thing we didn't really touch on on the video that I don't think most people realize is the amount of distance you drive um, weekly to go to these Chinese restaurants. Can you tell us a little bit about that, especially the people you know based internationally who don't really know the landscape of Los Angeles? I live in the Hollywood Hills uh, near the Hollywood sign. Most of the Chinese food in, in the LA area is, uh, the good food is in the San Gabriel Valley, which is a good, uh, depending on whether you're talking about the West Valley or the East San Gabriel Valley, is 15 to 30 miles from there. Uh, when I was working, actually, I wasn't too bad because I was working downtown, so that was 10 miles to the east. So actually, it was fairly convenient to go out to San Gabriel Valley, but now, these days, it's, you know, in Hollywood, it's, it's a pretty good drive to get out to San Gabriel Valley. So you would spend an hour, maybe even more, with traffic um, on the weekly just to get to Chinese food? Well, no, I'm not that crazy. I, I just kind of <laughs> time my driving. Fair. So, I, yeah, it may take an hour, hour and a half during rush hour, but if you go off hour, you know, maybe half hour, that's not too bad. And what is, speaking of the San Gabriel Valley, um, we, a lot of our video that we filmed last time talked a lot about historical trends. I was sort of wondering if you have any insights for future trends in the Chinese food scene in America in general. Uh, well, I think there are several. I think if you look at Los Angeles, you have the issue of, uh, which is actually the one I think you wrote about, uh, kind of based on some of the information you got from my spreadsheets about the changing geographic locus of Chinese food in uh, the Los Angeles area, where, you know, 40 years ago it started out in Monterey Park, and for the next 40 years, it's marched eastward from there, you know, a good 30, 40, 50 miles into the Chino Hills and then into Corona. So that's one change. And, uh, you know, Chinese people, uh, especially in the LA area, they love new houses. So what they do is they basically, uh, and over a period of decades, have followed the new residential uh, uh, subdivisions and uh, which typically is are built further and further from the central city so you see that geographic movement and then as we talked about in in the uh, video you also have the the flip in the uh, from Cantonese food to uh, other to more mainland regional cuisines. Um, throughout the years since the articles um, of you have come out, um, as well as this video, you've been getting a lot of recognition as well as restaurant invites. What are some of the most notable trips um, and restaurant invites that you have gotten as a result of this fame? Well, it hasn't been that many, but interestingly, we just came back from San Francisco where we got an invitation to uh, try out a new restaurant, Palette Dim Sum uh, and Tea House, which is another branch of Dragon Bowl restaurant. Oh wow! So the Dragon Bowl yeah. people, which in your video, in our video, you stated was the best Chinese restaurant in the United States, got, uh, reached out to you. Right. Yeah, because they saw the video, and I had been in contact with them previously because I had also once written a, a blog post to the point that, in my opinion, Dragon Ball was the best Chinese restaurant in the United States. And they saw the video, and I guess that reminded them that of our prior conversation. So just they said, hey, next time you're in San Francisco, come on by. We'd like you to try our new restaurant. So we did that last week, and uh, we just uh, got the, the royal treatment. Uh, we got to, to try like a dozen items off their menu when it was uh, uh, personally served by the general manager. And so that, that was really a fantastic experience. Wow. David, how do you respond to, you know, negative online comments who, you know, people who are like, oh, you didn't post a photo, or um, we saw a lot on our video comments um, that people are like, 
they dispute your claim that Dragon Bow is the best <laughs> restaurant in California or the United States, which of course is ridiculous because favoritism is very subjective. Um, but how do you deal with these comments? If it's opinion, I don't let that bother me. Uh, if it's factual, I will respond. I think, for example, somebody disputed the fact that I've been to so many Chinese restaurants. Uh, you know, I, I did the math, how can you go to many, that many Chinese restaurants? Well, fortunately, uh, I've gotten that reaction so many times. I actually wrote a re reply about that, which <laughs> explains the math. And I, uh, number one, I linked that article uh, in, in a response to that particular comment. And I mean, the answer is uh, that you know, I've been doing this for over 40 years, uh, and especially when I'm out of town uh, like I go to New York or San Francisco on business the same in New York on a week you know I'll eat you know at least three meals a day each at a different Chinese restaurant uh, and then I'll get a snack somewhere else so in that one week I could pick up you know 30 Chinese restaurants right there yeah yeah, and it's amazing how thorough you are and how meticulous of a record you keep um, of all of this, too. Being an accountant will do that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, David, for um, coming in from Los Angeles and uh, speaking to us. I know it's late for you over there, and I'm sure we will um, have another interview in the future. It seems to be like a reoccurring pattern. Okay, well, it's uh, always nice to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. All right. <laughs> Welcome back, guys. Um, yes, you can, as you can see, we're about to talk about merch. Um, but before I get to Clarissa's cap, which is very fetching, by the way, uh, I wanted to talk about that interview you just did. David must be very used to being interviewed by you. He is very used to being interviewed by me. Or rather, I'm used to talking to him and asking him questions. Weren't you the first person to interview him? Yeah, and the first time I met him, he was like, this is of no interest to anyone, but I have this gigantic spreadsheet of over 6,000 restaurants I've eaten at, documented in an Excel spreadsheet. And, and now it's 7,000. Now it's 7,000. That's insane. Uh, well, I'm really glad you got to reconnect with him. So, as you guys can see, Clarissa <laughs> is modeling our brand new merch, our cap. It's uh, fit very nice. Way. Yes, she's wearing it the right way. So, logo right there, logo right there. Uh, we've also got a tote bag. Tote bag. And iron on patches. Oh no, what With am I doing? Bows. No, this is difficult. This is so complicated. The mask, <laughs> Nick's camera, our logo, okay. mahjong tiles. Amazing. That you can iron on this thing or your clothes. So we're very, very excited to give it out. We wanted to do a big giveaway this time. Um, you know, somebody's gonna regret this, probably me, when we're packing all of these things. No. But we're giving a <laughs> whole bunch of things away to people. So if you see your name on the screen, uh, you're go you've, you've won something. You've or won. at least <laughs> a way to hear from us as well. So, um, oh, and I also want to show you guys um, our amazing playing cards. But the other way. But the other way, it makes more like sense. So, I don't know if you guys can see this, but we've designed this deck specifically for this occasion. Um, we're wow. very proud of it. It's different food as different suits. And like, yeah, I really like this, like, check it out. Like the queen of Bao is holding a big cha siu bao. <laughs> the cha same bao. one? Uh, is it the same one? No. Oh, wait. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, I hope you guys stay with us. We will be back same time, same place in two weeks' time on June the 25th. And please comment and tell us who you want to be interviewed or where you want us to go for our next story. And don't forget to um, like, follow, and subscribe. By the way, if you guys thought that name list was too quick, we'll be reaching out to you, so no worries.
see you next time. Goodbye. You've been watching The Gold Thread Show. Make sure to tune in to our next live stream coming on June 25th, 11 p.m. Eastern Time. See you then.